Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yanyan. Today is day number four as we're speaking about the use of the name of Jesus Christ and also the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the difference between the two. There seems to be confusion, but you know what? The Word of God removes all confusion. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome back to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. We are today taking up where we have been leaving off. And uh, yesterday we talked about the fact of Jesus' blood and Jesus' name and the difference between the two. The title of these lessons is called The Lord Your Healer. And uh, so I'm comparing in this the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the authority that's been given to us. I'm teaching out of my book on the grace of healing, and I know it's going to be a great blessing. And yesterday I also mentioned too, this one will be mentioned at halftime. Our announcer is going to come on and tell you how you can have a copy of this book for yourself. And this teaches healing from the hand of grace that comes to us. Most teaching on healing, which is wonderful, is on our faith and how we receive by faith. That is absolutely true. But listen, we have nothing to received by faith if God doesn't offer something in grace. Grace is God's full hand reaching out to you and faith is your empty hand reaching out to him to receive everything that you need for life and godliness. That's in the book called The Grace of Healing. But I have another one called How Deep Are the Stripes? And the purpose of this book was to go deeper than just physical healing into emotional healing. And there's where the stripes of Jesus Christ come. And the very first thing that Jesus mentioned in his own hometown was he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted, to bring liberty to those that are bruised. And he's talking about internal healing. And that's what this book is about, that God will also heal internally. And this book is not one that'll be mentioned at halftime, but you can go to my website and order this book for yourself. And especially if you know people who've been through emotional hurts and abuse and sexual abuse and all these things and just really mentally left them off balance, this will be a great book to bring them back in. And that book is available too. So thanks again for watching today. Thanks for all those that are watching for the first time. Welcome to the broadcast. Glad to have you here. I think you'll like it. And then also those who've been watching for a while, thank you for continuing to stay with it and watching this. But those of you who have been watching for a long time, really sold out on this teaching and have committed yourself to be a partner with me, thank you, thank you, thank you. And listen, if you've been watching for some time and you love the broadcast, your heart is hooked up with me, take the next step and become a partner with me. And a partner not always backs me with your prayers, but also your finances, because it takes finances to get these ministries out there. You say, well, God gets it out there. Yes, he does. But he does it through people giving. God doesn't rain down money from heaven. He leaves that up to us. God gives an anointing from heaven, a call from heaven, insight, revelation from heaven, but he doesn't send down money because he's not a counterfeiter. So he sends again the, his Holy Spirit, but he speaks to people to be part of it. That way we get part of the blessings. You know, I support ministries in, in other places around the world. I support my local church. That means when we get to heaven, the pastor is gonna get all the rewards. Those who faithfully gave to the church also get rewards. And those who stand with me in this broadcast, you'll have eternal rewards in heaven. At that time you realize, oh, it was so worth it to give temporary money for eternal results. Because through it, people got born again, spirit filled, but also they received healing. And they also became educated in the word of God, a walking, talking disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the word of God today. I'm going to mention some scriptures and kind of recover what we covered yesterday. And that was the difference between the, pur the purpose of Jesus' blood and the name. Let's talk about the purpose of Jesus' blood. Again, the purpose of Jesus' blood is for remission or the cleansing of sin for the sinner and for the Christian. For Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, it talks about that the blood of Jesus Christ has been given for the remission of sins. Remission of sins means forgiveness. Hebrews 9, 22 tells us almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Notice the purpose of the blood was for purging or cleansing cleansing, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission, again, means the taking away. What's the purpose of the blood of Jesus Christ? It's removal of sins from a sinner and removal of sins from a Christian. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 talks about we have propitiation and righteousness through faith in his blood. And Romans chapter 5 and verse 9 says we are justified, made righteous by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Three scriptures talk about redemption through his blood in the epistles. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. 
Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14 and 1 Peter chapter 1 and 19 all say the same thing. We have redemption through his blood. I think we've just about covered it that the way a sinner gets into the kingdom of God by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking about the, the liquid blood that was inside of it. It's what the blood stood for. Okay, we don't have to have bowls of it around today, nor do we have to have the communion elements turn into the real blood of Jesus on the inside of us. No, when he shed his blood, he tied himself in with all the Old Testament sacrifices, showing that the blood of animals, which could not remove sins, only could cover it for a moment. He is able to do that, but the blood of Jesus Christ represents his life. The life is in the blood. Jesus didn't come just to shed his blood for remission of sins. He said, I've come to give in my life a ransom for many. So the life of Jesus Christ was poured out for us that we can have the life of God inside of us. So we've just covered a number of scriptures that the blood of Jesus Christ removes the sin of sinners. How about the sins of Christians? Christians do sin. Peter sinned as a Christian. Others sinned as a Christian, Jesus' disciples. We find Christians throughout the New Testament. And if you've ever pastored a church, you know that Christians can sin. And on top of that, you don't look at me so, you know, naively. You've sinned also since you become a Christian. But what it takes to cleanse you as a Christian is exactly what it took to save you as a unbeliever, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. It took a lot of blood to save you, but it only takes a little bit to cleanse you as a Christian. First John 1, 7 says that when we as Christians confess our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Notice the same term found for sinners, but this is the cleansing of a Christian from the daily sins he has committed because the major sin in our life has been taken care of, rejection of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. All our past sins were forgiven, but what we commit each day were to take to the Lord as priests. We were not priests when we were sinners, we're now priests, and a priest takes his personal sins to the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he cleanses us us from all sins. 1 John 1, 9 says he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because why? When we as Christians commit something unrighteous, we need to go to Jesus as our great high priest. We go directly to him. And when we do, his blood cleanses us. It doesn't take much. This is more the drops of blood compared to all the outpouring of blood, which he gave at the cross. And so we find this out. There is the, there's the use of the blood of Jesus Christ for a Christian. But Jesus Christ owns his blood. The blood was not given to the church. Jesus owns his blood. Revelation 1, 5, we have been washed from our sins in his own blood. He owns the blood. We don't own the blood. 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I don't have possession of the blood. Jesus does. When I confess my sins, he cleanses me in his blood. Acts 20, 28, the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ owns the blood. The blood of Jesus only cleanses us from sins. It, we can't plead the blood. We can't claim the blood. We can't cover with the blood. We can't draw bloodlines. All the things that people try to do with the blood, we can't do it because we don't own it. All these things are unscriptural. There's no scripture that tells us as Christians we can plead the blood over a certain circumstance. This is the use of the name of Jesus. He has not given us the blood. He owns the blood, but he has given us the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, in the scriptures, you can't plead the blood, but we have Christians today trying to plead the blood and they plead the blood over circumstances and things that they don't like and demonic things when what he has given us against all those things is authority through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't claim the blood. You can't cover things with the blood. I cover that with the blood. No, you can't do that. You don't own the blood and that's not what the blood is for. The blood is not for authority. It is forgiveness of sins, period. Remission of sins, period. And for the sinner and for the saint. So that when you get born again, he doesn't give you the blood. He says here, I give you authority in my name. And so again, you can't draw bloodlines. Our salvation and soul winning makes us an overcomer over Satan and the world. The moment I got saved, I became an overcomer. And God then gives me the name of Jesus Christ for me to walk in that ability to overcome. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, they overcame him, that is Satan, by the blood of the lamb. That's the new birth. When we get saved, that's our first time we overcome Satan. 
Satan. And then by the word of their testimony, that's when we give our testimony and they didn't love their lives unto death. Overcoming by the blood of the lamb is the new birth. Overcoming by the word of our testimony is witnessing and soul winning and overcoming the world is through spiritual growth, our love for Jesus Christ above everything. We continue overcoming Satan and the world through maturity in God's word. First John chapter five, verses four and five says this, whatever, we could say whoever, for whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we become an overcomer over the world and Satan and all that. But who is he who overcomes the world? He who has believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So here we come back to this now. The name of Jesus Christ is the possession of every Christian. We don't own the blood, Jesus does. The blood doesn't give us authority over Satan, it cleanses us from sins. The blood gets rid of the problem, but the name of Jesus brings us the answers. That's what we're looking for. The name of Jesus is the possession of every Christian. Everyone born again has been given use of that name, and where it really comes to life inside of us is when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, we find them in the next chapter. That was chapter two of Acts, chapter three, Peter and John see the man at the gate beautiful, and what do they do? They pull that name out. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. The great commission has been given to us, but we exercise it in the name of Jesus. When we lay hands on the sick, we pray in the name of Jesus. When we bless our food, we pray in the name of Jesus. All this has been given to us, and that's our authority in the name of Jesus. Why can't a sinner do that? Because he's not part of the family that that authority has been given to. But if he does accept Jesus, the blood takes over at that case and cleanses him. But the moment he is cleansed, what's given to him next is the name of Jesus. And Jesus told his disciples, go out there and cast out devils in my name. They did not said, even devils are subject unto us through your name. The name of Jesus is our right of attorney. It's been given to us from heaven and we use that name. When my mom was dying, she turned over the right of attorney of her name to us so that when I signed her name, it was like she was signing her name. When Jesus Christ went to heaven and gave us his name, when Bob uses the name of Jesus, it's just like Jesus is using the name of Jesus, using his own name. So we have these things and we will cover these when we come back from the break. Again, this is the book that, that I want you to get for this broadcast is what I'm using for this broadcast, but also go to my website and get a copy of How Deep Are the Stripes. You'll be blessed by it. See you right after the break. How much faith do I need to be healed? In The Grace of Healing, Bob Yandian answers this question and reveals the missing ingredient to the healing you've been praying for, grace. Throughout church history, the doctrines of grace and faith have been taken to separate extremes as they relate to healing. The result is that many believers struggle to receive healing from God. Those on the side of grace deny the need for faith, believing that God only heals a select few. For those who only see a need for faith, the pursuit of healing becomes a legalistic struggle to change God's mind. Pastor Bob takes a different approach with practical biblical teaching that balances both elements of grace and faith. You'll find the healing you've been waiting for when you find the missing ingredient of grace. To order The Grace of Healing, visit bobyandian.com. With sin, Adam opened the door to every spiritual and physical curse for all mankind, including sickness. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. In How Deep Are the Stripes, Bobby Indian reveals that sickness and disease are the outward manifestations of eventual death. Their sole purpose is to keep you from fulfilling God's plan for your life. But Jesus came to give you life that includes health, wholeness, and victory in the course God has set before you. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, and gave you authority over every sickness or disease that would ever try to steal the health that belongs to you. Apply the revelation in this powerful book, and you will be equipped to walk in the wholeness which is yours in Jesus Christ. To order How Deep Are the Stripes, visit bobyandian.com or call 918 250 
Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Well, welcome back. I trust you'll get a copy of those books and uh, be blessed by them. Let's take up where we left off, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. The name of Jesus is the possession of every Christian. Whether you realize it or not, read it in scripture, or someone's told you about it, you still have been given the name of Jesus. It's not to be used flippantly, it's to be used in faith. Faith in the name of Jesus causes incredible miracles, signs and wonders to occur. Philippians chapter two, verses nine through 11 says, therefore, this is based on the death of Jesus in the previous verse. Therefore, Jesus' death on the cross, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. The name which is above every name is the name of Jesus. You say, why do they put that part in there? Because when we hear the name cancer, we go, <gasps> We think death immediately, it's just an overpowering word, cancer. Uh, when other diseases are named, we think of that. But there's a name that is the highest name in the universe, and the name of Jesus is over the name of cancer, disease, problems, depression, whatever you might have, the name of Jesus is more powerful. When you understand that and understand faith in the name of Jesus, then you understand where deliverance comes from. And he has sent us forth to preach the gospel in the name of Jesus. Verse 10 says here again in Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, on the earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this verse is simply saying there's gonna come a day when the name of Jesus will be shouted as he comes back and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. But until that time, we have been entrusted with that name as the family of God, as believers in Jesus Christ, as part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been given that authority. I wanna do a comparison. We've talked about the blood and its purpose. We've talked about the name of Jesus and its purpose. Let's compare the two back and forth. I might mention some things I've already mentioned but let's go back and talk about it, okay? The blood of Jesus was shed on the cross for us. This is the point where Jesus Christ became sin for us. He never committed a sin, was not born in sin like the rest of mankind. Jesus had no contact with sin because he would not allow it in his life, but on the cross, he allowed it to happen. He became sin. He did not sin on the cross, he became sin. He didn't sin to become sin. He accepted it of his own free will. So the blood of Jesus was shed on the cross and this represented the weakest time in his life. Whenever he committed himself and allowed and allowed a sin to overwhelm him, Jesus Christ died spiritually on the cross. He became as a sinner. This was his weakest time. So the Bible tells us he died in weakness, but was raised in power. So let's talk about that. The blood of Jesus was shed at his weakest time. This is when he died on the cross. This is when the whole earth went black and God had to turn his back on his own son. And I mean, it looked like there was, no, this was bad. I'm sure there was rejoicing in hell. They were having a party because they finally had Jesus. But what they didn't realize was they couldn't keep him because he had no sin of his own. He died for our sin. When he came and died for us, after three days and three nights, the sins of men were forgiven. The sins of men were remitted and Jesus Christ arose from the dead. How could he arise from the dead? He had no sins of his own. They couldn't keep him there. The reason why if you're not saved, you're gonna go to hell and you'll stay there forever is because they can keep you there. You're there for your sins. Jesus went there for our sins. When our sins were given, there was nothing left. Jesus could be raised from the dead. So the blood of Jesus was shed in weakness, but the name of Jesus was given in power. And the name of Jesus not only was given to his disciples before he left the earth, but it was also given to all of us. And therefore, in his resurrection, the name of Jesus was now seen and given to us in great power. Again, the blood of Jesus was shed in weakness. The name of Jesus was given in power. The name of Jesus was shed in weakness at his death on the cross. The name of Jesus was given in resurrection power when he arose from the dead. The name was given first to Jesus. 
His name was given to him. Then Jesus, in his walk on this earth, gave it to his disciples. Not to all that were believed, but to his disciples, first of all. And then at the resurrection and ascension into heaven, it was given to all who believe in him. In my name, you'll cast out devils. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name, in my name, in my name. And the first use of the name after Jesus ascended into heaven was in chapter three of Acts, where Peter and John said to the man at the gate, beautiful, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Again, there was comparisons. I made these before. Uh, the Red Sea speaks of the blood of Jesus Christ in salvation. And then uh, when they crossed over and went across the Jordan, it represented the forgiveness of sins in a believer. And so the Red Sea took them out of Egypt into the wilderness. And the next one crossing the Jordan River took them out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And uh, the first one, the Red Sea represents salvation, but then crossing the, uh, the river, Jordan River, this represents a Christian coming back into fellowship with God. They were believers on both sides, but in one place they were carnal. They came across the river and came into the promised land and there they were spiritual. And uh, they represented again, confessing sins as a believer. So Pharaoh sent in his armies and his strength. Let's talk about that again. The Red Sea is a type of our salvation representing death. Pharaoh sent in his armies, that was his strength. In Israel's weakest time of coming through the Red Sea when they looked so vulnerable, this is when Pharaoh's army was at their strength and they came right in behind them and it looked like great strength against great weakness. The Red Sea swallowed up Israel's curse, which was slavery to Egypt. And so when Israel came out on the other side, they were totally free. Israel went in, but they came out. Egypt's army went in and drowned and never came out. What are we saying? When the children of Israel walked into the Red Sea, they were going there in weakness. They were There was nothing they could do. They were just human beings going through this water and behind them was everyone with all the weapons. That was all the armies coming after them, the armies of Egypt. And they came with all their horses and chariots, all their weapons. And they were gonna kill them all as they went in there. And then they were gonna turn around and come back out. But they went in and they were drowned. But Israel went in and went through and then came out on the other side. What are we saying here? Jesus Christ on the cross was like going through the Red Sea. He was in his weakest point. He died in weakness. God's weakness, though, is stronger than the strength of Satan. On the cross, we see the weakness of God, but we see the strength of Satan, and God's weakness was stronger than the strength of Satan. God raised Jesus from the dead three days later. Jesus was sown in weakness, but raised in power. Sown in weakness was when he died on the cross, raised in power was three days later when he came out of the grave and raised by the power of God. But the demonstration that Satan had was the exceeding greatness of his power. Satan came at Jesus with everything that he had and he still lost. The blood of Jesus Christ comes back to this. The blood of Jesus Christ doesn't give life it kills. It removes sins out of your life. It's the Holy Spirit that gives you life. The blood of Jesus Christ is not a life-giving agent. It is a sin-removing agent and basically kills us. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, the blood of Jesus Christ basically comes in and removes our sins and removes the life we had and makes room for us to be resurrected from the dead. But Jesus Christ wasn't resurrected from the dead by his blood. It's when the Holy Spirit Spirit came upon him. He was resurrected from the dead on the third day as the Holy Spirit came upon him. When I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, the first thing that hits me is the blood of Jesus Christ and removes all of my sins. But the next thing that hits me is the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives me life. So when we went into the Red Sea, we came out on the other sides. Our sin went in, but it died in there and did not come out. And the Egyptian army went in, but didn't come out. God spared me all the way through and they had no weapons, they had nothing. They simply walked through with faith in God, but faith in God in your weakness is greater than Satan and all of his strength. So the blood basically speaks of death to our sins and our former life. The name of Jesus given to us speaks of resurrection life. Colossians chapter two, verses 12 through 15 tells me I was buried with him in baptism. Notice that when I got born again, I was buried with him because God saw me as dead. So 
I was buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all of your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the law that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So what we have there is again, what happened to us when we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and although I died with him on the cross, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed my sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ didn't give me life. It's the Holy Spirit that gave me life. And what raised Jesus from the dead was the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about that. What happens to us when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. Now the name of Jesus has given us power. I not only have power in me, the power of the new birth, I have power to give out of me and set other people free. That is given to me in the name of Jesus. Philippians chapter two, verses eight through 11. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus gave his name to the church to be used. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, Jesus tells him after his resurrection, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now you go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So whatever authority Jesus was given, which was all authority, he now gives to us. He had all authority, but that's all been given to us in our separate callings, separate things that God has sent us into. We use that authority of Jesus' name. Jesus' authority has given us and use includes the use of his name. Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. And verse 19 says, as Jesus said to them, I give to you authority to tread on serpents. That's big demons and scorpions, little demons, and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So you know what? It comes back to this. Jesus owns the blood, but we own the name. The name of Jesus is our possession to be used, not flippantly, not just a, as a magic word to, to quote over circumstances. No, faith in that name is what causes it to happen. Even Peter said that about the man at the gate beautiful. It wasn't just the name, it was faith in the name that caused this man to be totally clean and healed in your presence. Use the name of Jesus wisely. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com to contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.